Steve Keen, uh, who's travelled from the UK, I guess. Um, uh, close. Nearby to the UK <laughs> to join us. Um, so my name is Carl Middleton. I am a, the Deputy Director of the Master of Arts in International Development Studies and Director for CSDS. Um, we're co-hosting this together with MBM, MBMG Group. Um, so we'll have a, the public lecture will be approximately 40 minutes. Um, and then we're also honored to have Emeritus Professor Sotipan Chavatiwa uh, from the Faculty of Economics of Chulwong Kwan University, uh, who will be a discussant to Professor Keen. Uh, so before we start, I should um, say thanks to a couple of groups. First, to the CSDS team for helping to organize this event, and to Frank O'Neill, the main student, uh, who's catalyzed this event to happen, and to bring uh, Steve to us. And then also thanks so much to everybody in the room who's taken the time to join us today and to hopefully contribute to a very dynamic uh, discussion today. So I'll briefly introduce Professor Keane. Um, so until 2013, he was an associate professor in the Faculty of Economics of the professor, University of... Professor, but still. Oh, sorry, professor <laughs> uh, of Uni University of Western Sydney. And then uh, since then, he was professor and head of the School of Economics in History and Politics at Kingston University in London. Uh, he is the author of the book Debunking Economics that offers a critique of neoclassical economic theory and many of its assumptions that he attempts to show are fundamentally flawed. His most recent book is titled Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? So Professor Keen is also very active as a public intellectual. Um, he publishes blogs and podcasts. He's a regular commentator in the media and he has his own comic series as well as being a member uh, working with the uh, platform Patreon as a crowd-funded uh, source, a uh, crowd-funded professor. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll offer the floor to Professor Thank you. Lee. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Uh, I'm, my own hearing, I'm hearing quite a bit of feedback. Oh, pardon me. It's, it's, okay. Thank you. I'm hearing quite a bit of feedback from the air conditioning, so if it's not loud enough, let me know. And I'll go too quickly also, let me know. Just, just basically do a, sort of a, a slow down signal to me and I'll slow down, because I know I talk too quickly uh, in my own students in Australia and in the UK. Uh, what I want to focus on today is why debt and money matter, as well as disequilibrium. And I know that um, a lot of economics, it's, it's second nature to think in terms of intersecting supply and demand curves, equilibrium. And I want to say that second nature needs to be thrown out the window. It was, I, it was understandable as a, a shortcut to dynamics in the 19th century. It is unforgivable as a shortcut to dynamics in the 21st century. I want to talk about why. Now, partly, uh, I don't know how many students of the Masters here have done economics at undergraduate level before doing it here, uh, but certainly undergraduate textbooks and textbooks I've seen for Masters economics courses, uh, I, I don't. I think there's only one or two written by people I know personally that don't give you an argument about money being irrelevant. In other words, money being something that just determines nominal values, whereas what actually matters are real values, and their money is just a veil over barter, and we can ignore the monetary dynamics. Now, for about 30 years, I've been quoting fellow non-orthodox economists to challenge that view. And uh, as of five years ago, I can now quote the Bank of England, which I'm eternally grateful to the bank's research staff for making that possible because they came out with a paper in 2014 called Money Creation in the Modern Economy. And as part of that, they said the reality of how money is created differs from the description found in some economics textbooks. Now, by some, they mean 99.7% of textbooks, the 0.3% written by people like Shapiro uh, that recently deceased, those textbooks are the only ones that mention an alternative. But in talking about it, the bank very simply said, bank lending creates deposits. It's more complex than just that, but that's the starting point. Rather than deposits creating loans, which is the conventional view, loans create deposits. And then say the bank does not uh, fix the amount of money in circulation, nor is it multiplied out by more loans and deposits. So I can now quote an authoritative source rather than quoting a rebel economists to make this case these days. And there are two incorrect models that textbooks use. One is called loanable funds. You might, if you ever read Paul Krugman's blog, you'll get that interminably as his model of how banks operate, which sees banks as intermediaries between savers and borrowers. Which that means when you think about it, it means that the, if banks are intermediaries, 
then the debt is an asset of the saver, not an asset of the bank. Okay? And then the money multiplier model, where a depositor walks into a bank, deposits uh, 10,000 baht, and then there's a money multiplier process that increases that to 100,000 baht over a, a cycling between one bank and another, deposits and loans and so on. But both those models are wrong. Now here's Krugman in 2012 making a statement which is factually incorrect, saying, first of all, individual bank does have to lend out money it receives in deposits. Can't issue out of thin air, financial intermediary, bias at the funds they have in hand, etc., etc. Here's the Bundesbank, 2017, saying, money and credit are created as a result of complex interactions between banks, non-banks and the central bank, which is the, 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 broad, the broader statement behind what the Bank of England said in 2014. And then saying, this refutes a popular misconception that banks act simply as intermediaries. Only grant credit using funds placed with them previously as depositors by the customers. Now, when we say something is a popular misconception, what we normally mean is the public believes something the experts know is wrong. In this particular case, most of the public, I've found, understands that bank lending creates deposits, that banks create money. So it's not a popular misconception, it's a misconception by something like 80% of the economics profession. Only about 20%, which is roughly the proportion of economists that are not really serious believers in neoclassical theory, understand that banks create money. So I want to show why this matters, because if you think about the idea of loan, loanable funds, it's that banks are transferring money from a saver to a borrower. And if that happens, then no new money is created. The location of money goes from the saver's bank account to the borrower's bank account or the bank of the borrower's cash dash back at home, and there's no new spending power. And this is Ben Bernanke using that proposition to reject Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory of the Great Depression and saying unless there are implausibly large differences in spending propensities between the savers and the borrowers, pure redistributions, that's the point where you say this is a pure redistribution, that's what they see lending as, should have no significant macroeconomic effects. So he really, he's seen as being an expert on the Great Depression. What he is is an expert on explanations of the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical theory. Now, what I call, what used to be called endogenous money, the theory that says banks actually create money, I prefer to call bank originated money and debt because endogenous money doesn't mean anything to people who aren't experts in the field itself. Whereas bank originated money and debt, I think makes sense to anybody who's not an economist. And it's got a nice acronym as well, BOMBED. And I think the, the global economy has been bombed by letting banks do too much of this. So new money and spending power are created simultaneously with debt. Bank lending expands the money supply and demand as well. And then when banks are repaid, the money supply and demand contract at the same time. And I want to show why those differences matter. So I want to show, working from one of the most essential propositions in macroeconomics, that ex expenditure is income. What you spend, becomes income for somebody else. Okay, that's an essential foundation for macroeconomics. And I can show why credit, which is bank-created money, matters for macroeconomics just by using this logic. So I'm going to divide the economy into three sectors. And it doesn't matter what those sectors are. It could be agriculture, industry and services. It could be government, non-government, and foreign sector. It's the general proposition just divide the economy in three ways. And then imagine, consider that each sector is spending money on the other two and receiving money from the other two. And I, I call this a Moore table in the order of Basil Moore, who's the post-Keynesian economist who pushed most strongly for the reality that banks create money and that this mattered to the macro economy. So in this table, the diagonal is expenditure. Okay? This is where sector one coincides with sector one in the rows and columns of the matrix. So that's expenditure and that's shown as a negative. The off diagonal is income, that's where the expenditure goes. Now necessarily each row must sum to zero because your expenditure becomes income for somebody else. But the columns can sum to positive or negative because your expenditure can differ from your income. And I'm gonna look at three arrangements for this. One is where there's 
what I call, I call Say's Law. In fact, it's Say's Law in reverse. Rather than supply creates its own demand, its demand creates its own supply. That's no lending. So money just circulates. There's no possibility of borrowing money either from another uh, person or from a bank. Then loanable funds, where there's lending between two sectors, where the bank plays no active role, so I'm leaving the bank out of that situation. And then the third, the real world, where banks originate money and debt, and the bank is a fourth sector that lends to one of the sectors. And I don't show the bank's assets in this table because it would just be too small on screen. But fundamentally, what happens with the bank loan is the bank assets increase and the liabilities increase as well. And then with the extra money, the person who borrowed that money spends it on one of the other sectors. So let's look at them each. Here's Say's Law. And they, so they're on the, uh, this is expenditure by sector one on sectors two and three. Sector expenditure by sector two on sectors one and three. Expenditure by sector three on sectors one and two. And of course, necessarily each row sums to zero. And the sum of the negative of the sum of the diagonal is expenditure. And the sum of the sum of all the off diagonal is income. And of course, they're necessarily equal ones. This is expenditure by sector one, uh, generating income for sectors two and three. And there's the income for sector one from spending by sectors two and three. Now, when you look at that, if you sum up either the diagonal or the off diagonal, and I'm going to sum the diagonal in these ex exercises, you pretty much get Milton Friedman's quantity theory of money. If you say there's a certain amount of stock of money in existence, turning over V times per year, then you get income is, is money times the velocity of money. Now, for loanable funds, sector two is lending money to sector one, which I show as a flow along the diagonal. And then, of course, sector one pays sec interest to sector two because there must be an outstanding debt. And then sector one spends on sector three. And this is just to make it simple. I could make it more elaborate, but without loss of generality, this applies to the general situation we see in the real world. Or we see if, if, if there, was no, no, there were no banks in the real world. So here what you have is sector two is lending credit to sector one and spending D minus credit on sector three. And then sector one pays interest to sector two, which is why sector two made the loan. So what you have is a flow of credit going in this direction and then the expenditure of credit. Because nobody borrows for the sheer pleasure of being in debt. You borrow to spend. And that's showing that expenditure there. Now, when you sum this matrix and see what the effect is, you find that interest turns up as part of aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. So it's more general than the Say's Law situation. I don't know that neoclassicals realise this, but in this particular world, gross financial transactions turn up as part of aggregate income and aggregate uh, expenditure. That's where they turn up. Now, but if this were true, credit, see, credit cancels out. So if loanable funds was a proper description, uh, institutionally accurate description of what banks actually did, you could ignore the banking sector in doing macroeconomics. What about the real world, where banks originate money and debt? Well, in this case, bank, the bank se banking sector lends to sector one, and that creates money. And sector one then spends that money on sector three. So I show the same basic logic. You can check it out yourself and see that each row sums to zero, which is absolutely necessary. Now, when you do the same approach of, uh, of course, the credit, where I'm not showing here the bank liability, bank assets increase as much as bank liabilities do. That's what balances this table. Again, I'd need a much wider screen to show that as well. But under the same operation here, I sum up the negative of the diagonal, and what I find is that aggregate in income and aggregate expenditure include credit. And that's what's left out of the mainstream by ignoring the facts that banks create money. The credit does not cancel out. Now, I've actually seen it argued by a modern monetary theorist just recently that the endogenous money debate was relatively trivial. That is wrong. Credit plays an essential role. And we have to acknowledge that in modern monetary theory as well as acknowledging it 
in conventional economics. So banking can't be ignored in macroeconomics. And because credit's the most volatile component of aggregate demand and aggregate income, then it plays the major role in determining the direction of the economy. And this is showing it in the point of view of Thailand now. Because what you can see when you look at the level of private debt and the change in private debt, which is what is credit, because when you borrow money from a bank, if you borrow a million baht from a bank, the bank records you owe them precisely a million dollars. A million baht, pardon me. So there's an identity between the change in debt and the change in money. And then you spend that money buying whatever asset you want to buy with the... Um, but look at this. That's the red line for private debt. Now, it is obviously rising exponentially. Then the crisis and it plunges. And here's the change in that debt. And it's hard... I'll just see if I can actually make it a bit easier to see the numbers there. The change in debt which is credit, reached 30% of GDP at the peak of the boom before the crisis. And after the crisis, when it plunged, it became minus 20% of GDP. So you think about it in terms of, if we can imagine that my borrowed money was spent just buying goods, oh, sorry, existing money was spent just buying goods and services, whereas borrowed money was spent buying assets, then what you have is demand going from 1.3 times GDP to 0.8 of GDP in a matter of two years. That's why the crisis was so severe. And it turns up extremely obviously in the data. So in that sense, the Asian financial crisis was not a black swan. It's only a black swan if you ignore the banking sector. So the only people who couldn't see it coming were conventional economists. Anybody looking at this data and worrying about the level of private debt would have said, something seriously bad is going to happen, and it did. And you can see also, if you take a look at the, uh, what happened during the global financial crisis, there wasn't much of a change. In fact, you had a bit of a rise in credit across that period. So overall, you, Asia managed to avoid the financial crisis in 2008 because it already had it back in 1997. There'd been a huge plunge in the level of private debt courtesy of that and not much happened across the global financial crisis, then you had a rise in private debt, which is now levelled out. But you're still at a level of private debt here, which is about twice what it was back in the 80s. And my, in my opinion, you'd be better off going back to the level of debt you had back then, finding a way to get back to 40 to 60% of GDP as your private debt level rather than 120%. Because anything above 100, credit stands to be, have a very major role in the economy. Now, let's now look at just, just, it's hard to get good unemployment data in Thailand right now. This is using the employment data, and I've moved it forward a year because the data is at the end of the year to make it correspond a bit more to the data for credit. But that shows you the correlation of credit and the level of change and the level of employment in the economy. So it's a major determining factor. And that's what's missing from mainstream macroeconomic, which is why it's so misleading. Not the only reason, but it's a seriously important reason that they're not going to get their heads around because they still think in equilibrium terms and they leave money out of their logic, which are two huge errors that mean you, you can't rely upon them for guidance about how the economy operates. So what I want to do is show you how to use my software package I call Minsky to, um, to analyse. I'm in honour of Hyman Minsky, obviously. And I took a model done by uh, Paul Krugman and uh, Eggertson back in 2012, where they did a very stylized dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of lending, uh, where a patient consumer goods producing agent lent to an impatient investment goods producing agent. And then, of course, the bank, uh, bank's profit out of this came through what they call an intermediation fee. Now, this is a very clumsy thing to do in, um, in a DSGE model, but doing it in Minsky, I can make it much more dynamic, quite literally. So this is the latest version of Minsky here. And what Minsky does is let you build a view of the economy using double entry bookkeeping. So this is looking at the economy from the uh, banking sector's point of view. And what I have is the consumer sector lending from its deposit account at the bank to the investment sector. So the consumer sector account goes down, the investment sector goes up. I'll just make that a bit larger. Again, it's pretty hard to see on screen there. Let's just make that larger so you can see it properly. OK. 
Okay. So there's lending by the consumer sector to the investment sector. There's the investment sector repaying the consumer sector. There's the investment sector paying interest to the consumer sector. And then the consumer sector is paying a fee to the bank for introducing the borrower to the, to the saver. Then you have wages being paid by the consumer sector to hire workers, wages paid by the investment sector, the investment sector buying consumer goods, the consumer sector buying investment goods, the workers consuming, the bankers consuming, and the bankers investing. Okay. Now that's one of the beauties of double entry bookkeeping to explain this. If I tried to do this using the conventional framework that system dynamics programs use of flowcharts, that would be impossible to read. But I think the logic is fairly obvious from the table itself. And then over in the program, if I just zoom in a bit, let's see. What's going on here is these are defining each of the flows using uh, the standard system dynamics technology of a flow chart that's actually dynamic. I can move it around if I want to. And this is, a, this is an equation. This is saying the level of, uh, in this case, um, the purchases of consumer goods by the investment sector is related to the bank account, the amount of money in the bank account of the investment sector, divided by a time constant, which tells you how many years it would take for the purchases of the investment sector for consumer goods to double, roughly speaking. What Minsky is doing in the background is converting all these flowchart and um, double entry bookkeeping terms to equations. So you wouldn't know it when you're writing a, 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 a mint entry in what we call a godly table, but you're actually defining a set of differential equations there. Okay. Now I can then simulate this model and see what happens, run it over time. And what I've got happening here is just up in the top left hand corner here, I have the rate of lending there and the rate of repayment here and I can change them dynamically as the program runs and see what happens. And the main thing to look at is the level of GDP. So I'll just zoom in and take a look at the GDP chart in a bit more detail. If I run it, let's run it from there. No, I can't. I can run it from here. Ah. Pardon me. Make my trying to get the. Ah. Okay. The GDP is flatlining at 200. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is change the rate of lending to make lending happen more rapidly. And notice the growth rate fell. And then I have repayment happening more slowly as well. The growth rate falls again. But overall, GDP is still flatlining at about 200. And notice the level of debt down here, the debt to GDP ratio, is rising very substantially. But nothing is happening to the money supply. The money supply is remaining constant. And the economy is still running at about 200 in billion baht or whatever term you might be using for your currency. If I come back and I then slow down re lending, so lending happens more slowly and repayment happens more quickly, notice the growth rate increases. You then have a fall in the debt ratio. So debt's now plunging. But GDP is still pretty much the same level. And this simulation has been running for 65 years now. That's shown over in the, uh, the top right-hand corner over here, 70 years. So from that point of view, if this, if, if this actually model actually accurately described, if loanable funds actually accurately describe what banks do, you could ignore them in macroeconomics. It wouldn't matter. So that's what I'm showing there. Huge changes in credit and debt. Nothing much happens to GDP. So it would be a sensible Occam's razor decision not to include the banking sector in macroeconomic models. Now, I can rapidly modify this to being the real world because notice here I've got um, lending happening here, but there's no sign of the debt. Why is that? Simple reason, the debt is not an asset of the banking sector. It's an asset of the consumer sector. So I can bring up the consumer sector's view of the economy here. Make it a bit larger so you can see it on screen there. And notice I've got debt shown as an asset there. Well, I can simply delete that asset. 
it's gone. And delete the operations of lending and repayment, come over to the banking sectors and say, well, in fact, the loan in the real world, the debt is an asset of the banking sector. So I can make room for an extra asset. The program remembers there's still a liability, which is the debt level. It's looked very small there. We don't actually amplify that yet. That's one of the things we need to fix in terms of programming. And Minsky brings across the operations here. I can now say the interest payments are made to the bank rather than to the other, uh, the, to the consumer sector, and delete the bank fee. That's all the changes I've made to the model. I'll reset the model and go back to the beginning and reset the rate of lending to the same as I showed for the loanable funds model. Then make the same, run the program. Notice for, there'll be several changes right away. First of all, the growth rate is positive. GDP is growing, which is not what was happening in the previous model. And the increase in money is equivalent to the increase in debt as well. Then if I have lending happening more quickly, the growth rate rises. Repayment more slowly, it rises even further. Then if you have an increase in how fast people repay debt and a slowdown in lending, you have a fall in GDP. That's a crucial difference between the wrong model that's taught in the textbooks and an accurate model of how banks actually behave. And it's simple to show it in a monetary non-equilibrium model, which is what Minsky as a software package lets you build. That's why it's so wrong to learn this model, so wrong to believe it. But unfortunately, the majority of economics professors believe this and they don't want to consider anything else because it changes how they think about the world completely. And we know once you're de dedicated to a particular belief system, it's incredibly hard to absorb another one. One of my uh, good colleagues from my student days at Sydney University, who's now a professor at um, the University of Technology in Sydney, Rod O'Donnell, uh, he and I were speaking at an economics conference one year in the same session, and he told the audience, please do not read Keynes. Rod's an expert on the history of thought of Keynes. And I thought, why are you saying that? And he then said, because when you read it, you read it through neoclassical glasses, and what you see simply isn't there. And what you say is Keynes when you talk about it is a, is a myth. So please just don't even bother. Don't read him. You'll get it wrong. It's the same thing as trying to sell somebody who's a, a, a Christian to read the read the uh, the Koran. They'll pick out the bits they don't like. That's what they tell you in the Koran. Or, or, or the you know, Bada Vista, whatever else. Once you've got a particular religion, it's incredibly hard to change to another one. Better off becoming an agnostic. Okay, so in this case, huge changes in debt and credit, huge changes in GDP. You simply cannot ignore the financial sector. Now, one of the reasons they do ignore the financial sector is because if you bring it in, you necessarily end up working in a non-equilibrium world. And this is one of the great problems of, of neoclassical thought. They're not aware that the original founders of neoclassical thought saw equilibrium thinking as a shorthand to enable them to make analysis in the 19th century when it wasn't possible to think in dynamic terms in the 19th century. And back in those days when Volra and Jevons and Marshall made the decision to think in equilibrium terms, they knew they were doing effectively what they called statics when they realised that dynamics was the necessary thing to do and they thought dynamics would be done in the 20th century. Now, in fact, every time neoclassicals attempted to prove some way of modelling worked, they found it was unstable. Now, the reaction to that, uh, these are the two of the most important, is what one's called the sonnenschein mantel de Broer theorem, and that argues that that works out whether you can derive a market demand curve that has the same downward sloping shape as an individual demand curve. The answer is you can't, unless you impose the assumption that all people have identical tastes and that all goods are, not only that, all goods are the same as well. Okay? If you have identical consumers and identical goods, then you will get a downward sloping market demand curve. But if you have that, you've only got one consumer and one product. What happens to relative prices? They disappear completely. So it's nonsense. And they do a similar thing to what's called the Perron-Frobenius theorem to try to avoid 
with that. So they end up ignoring or distorting the result, and that's where the representative agent nonsense has come from in economics. If, they, if the Sonnenschein and Mantel de Berth theorem showed you could derive a market demand curve that sloped downwards, we would never have had the representative agent being developed, would never have been necessary. It's a distortion of reality. It's not a simplification, it's a distortion. So they build what I call mythematical models. They look like they're mathematics, but in fact they're mythematics. Okay? And a lot of people see mathematics as the enemy. I see it as the friend, because if you do it properly, you wouldn't be doing anything resembling neoclassical economics. All the results that have been found before, and particularly the two I've mentioned on screen there, would have meant it would have been changed quite radically from its foundation, even though they wouldn't have wanted to. Now, a similar thing applies in mathematics. If you go back two and a half thousand years, back to the Pythagoreans, one element the Pythagoreans believed about numbers, that were all numbers, were ratios of two integers. Now, of course, we know that there are irrational numbers and transcendental numbers and complex numbers, all of which have been invented by mathematicians to understand the real world or just for the sheer fun of it after that period. But when the Pythagoreans first realised that there were numbers which were not the ratio of two integers, we believe their reaction was to drown the person who first made that discovery. It was a proof using pent uh, pen pentagons that the square root of five could not be the ratio of two integers. I've forgotten his name. I mentioned it in debunking economics, but we understand that he was thrown overboard in the middle of the Mediterranean and drowned. Okay. But the Pythagoreans, to their credit, they drowned the person who found the result. They did not drown the result. Ultimately, they accepted the existence of irrational numbers, and then they could solve quadratics. And then later on, we invented complex numbers to solve other forms of quadratics, which didn't have a root at all uh, in, in, the, in the real numbers. And with those changes, we built the modern world. Without those changes, I would be talking through a megaphone made of granite. Okay? We wouldn't be in a high-rise building, we'd be in a cave somewhere. So mathematics overcame its obsession with believing that all numbers were the ratio of two integers. Economics has not overcome its obsession with forcing the economy into an equilibrium straitjacket. And what you get is extremely complicated models that I call pseudo-mathematical, mathematical. They look complicated, they are complicated. It's because they've got to be complicated to get around the error that they're still trying to hang on to. I so call neoclassical economics a magnificent failure. The models are so complicated that their practitioners believe they must be scientific, but they're wrong. If they understood their own mathematics, they would never have gone into this stuff in the first place. So what's in the real world, disequilibrium or far from equilibrium behavior is the norm. And engineers understand this, and engineers, who are the applied mathematicians in that sense, have built a whole range of technologies to enable that to be modeled. They call them system dynamics. The first system dynamics program was invented in MIT about 50 years ago by Jay Forrester. And there's uh, programs like Simulink and VizSim dominate engineering. Um, mathematicians use what's called system modeler. There's programs called VenSim, I think, Stellar. There's an enormous range of programs. I've designed Minsky for economics because none of those programs, uh, other programs, offer what I call godly tables, which are double entry bookkeeping tables that let you model financial dynamics and understand them. It's much, much harder to build monetary dynamics using the other programs than it is using Minsky. So I just want to show what these models look like. This is Lorenz's model of weather, of, of weather turbulence. It's actually a model of effectively a pot of, a pot of soup on the stove. I'm trying to get my mouse to... Yeah, where are we going? Okay. So you can build these models in Minsky as well and in and all the other programs too. So what I've got here is a model of the X and Y location of a drop of water on a stove with a temperature different temperature differential of Z between the top and bottom of the hot plate, effectively. And if you simulate this model, I've got two simulations differing by an absolutely tiny amount in the initial conditions, so tiny you don't even see it turning up here in the numbers. But if you simulate this, then you can see what's called the butterfly effect turning up in the diagrams. And you'll notice the X value from both simulations are identical for about six to eight, about eight seconds so far. That's the number of seconds of time 
on the stove being shown down on the, the bottom graph here. You notice they're starting to diverge slowly. And then after a short while, about 15 seconds, they're totally different. And that's why only short-term weather forecast is possible. And so when this was shown by a meteorologist called Lorenz to, to mathematical meteorologists in the, 90, in the 1960s, they said, right, we've got to abandon equilibrium linear models. Let's start building with nonlinear models. And that's been the basis of the dramatic improvement of weather forecasting in the last 40 or 50 years, despite the damage we've done to the climate across the same time period. So that's the sort of thing we should be using. And Minsky lets you do that. Now, I've built a model of Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And I want to show you two versions of that. This is a model where I simply make assumptions about, uh, I assume, a linear reaction by workers to the rate of employment and by capitalists to the rate of profit in terms of how fast they invest. And if I simulate this, let's actually make this the right scale. I'm not quite certain why it hasn't. That's better, okay. I'm going to, if I start with a, a low level of desire to invest by capitalists, because you'd like them to have a high level of desire to invest, I simulate this model. You're getting cycles in the employment rate, rate cycles in the wage share of GDP, and a slowly rising level of private debt. If I run that, I've run it for 85 years so far, you can see it's going to converge to an equilibrium point. Okay. Now, if I have a higher level of desire to invest by capitalists, which superficially is what you'd want to have happen, it looks the same to begin with. And notice two things about the simulation. First of all, the cycles are getting smaller, more rapidly than they were in the previous simulation. Secondly, the wager share of GDP is falling, so that the if you compare banker's share to wager share, it's tilting over this way, whereas comparing banker's share to capitalist share, it's vertical. So the capitalists are fluctuating around a constant level. The amount of money going to bankers is rising at the expense of workers, even though in the model, it's the firms that are borrowing the money, not the workers. So workers pay for the high level of private debt. Now, if I continue the simulation, the cycles which are getting smaller start to get bigger. And ultimately, you'll get a breakdown in the model. This is an incredibly simple model. It's worked out simply by using basic standard high school calculus to differentiate three variables. The wages share of GDP, which is wages divided by the level of GDP. The employment rate, which is the number of people with a job divided by population. And the debt ratio, private debt ratio, which is the level of debt divided by GDP. If I differentiate that and feed in very simple linear assumptions about the rate of, the rate of increase of wages depending upon the employment rate and the rate of investment depending upon the rate of profit, I get this model. So all the complicated nonsense that neoclassicals go through gave them no insights into the financial crisis back in 2008. And they actually thought this period of diminishing cycles here was a good thing. That's why they called the Great Moderation, and they congratulated themselves on bringing it about. And this was the exogenous shock they called the, uh, the Great Recession. And they have no explanation for that. It comes out of one model. Okay. It's what's called an emergent property of a complex system. And the very important thing here, showing the decline in wages share, we've been speaking about an increase in inequality ever since Piketty. We know how bad that is. This is saying part of that increase in inequality has come out of rising private debt levels. And when that increase in inequality comes about, it's, it's not just a bad thing that the rich are getting more and the poor are getting less. It's a prelude to a financial crisis. So it isn't saying just that it's not nice to have income inequality. There will always be income inequality. It's saying this form of income inequality will lead to an economic crisis. 
Now that's all very simply done by Minsky. I'm going to show one more model just quickly because one reason for the cycles being a similar scale on either side is that they have linear behavioural propositions for the uh, rate of change of wages and the rate of change of uh, invest of, of rate of level of investment. Uh, this is just bringing in nonlinear equations here, and if I then simulate this. You get more extreme cycles, but the tendency is more down than up, which is what we see in the real world. Okay. So you use nonlinear behavioral relations, which are what is going on down here. These are defining a, an exponential relationship for um, investment as a function of profit and an exponential one for wage change as a function of the um, rate of employment down here. So that's the idea of, you get complex cycles out of a system because the system is dominated by interactions between different variables in the system, whereas neoclassicals linearize everything and eliminate the non-equilibrium behavior, or they impose stability on unstable equilibria because they can't handle unstable equilibria. I'm sorry, the real world has them. So economics needs to grow up. And a very important book for me in forming my approach to economics was by an applied mathematician called John Blatt, who was he's Austrian by birth, Australian by nationality, and was professor of applied mathematics at the University of New South Wales, where I did my PhD, and also studied mathematics. And he wrote he, he wrote a book called Dynamic Economic Systems, which I've linked on my my website. I've, you'll see a link to it in a moment. You can download it and have a look at the book. I highly recommend it because it shows how mathematics can be combined with good history of economic thought to advance political economy rather than being a threat to political economy. And he was so horrified by what economists called dynamics that he wrote this statement saying, a baby is expected to first crawl and then walk before running, but what if a grown-up man is still crawling? He said, at present, the state of our dynamic economics is more akin to a crawl than a walk, to say nothing of a run. And I th used to think this was a hyperbolic statement, but I think it's now quite feasibly a, a, a prophetic one. Some may think that capitalism as a social system may disappear before its dynamics are understood by economists. Well, frankly, economics has got worse in the last 30 years. Paul Romer said that just recently, saying it's gone backwards for 30 years. So in some ways, what Blatt said has got even worse, and it is now, given global warming and the probability that we're going to have to enforce rationing on energy to enable us to survive the crisis we're going to go through, it would be a big stretch to call what happens under that world a capitalist economy. So quite possibly that's going to be correct. Capitalism will cease to exist before economists understand its dynamics. So we need complex systems economics. And I've designed Minsky to make that easy to do. It still needs a lot of work, so I've actually established a Patreon page to raise money for Minsky's development. I've never received any government funding for Minsky. I did get money for the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I raised money through a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. I threw in some of my own money, which I've now run out of. Um, so we, we, it's an open source program, but we are now only providing the Apple and Windows versions through a Patreon page. And to, to sign up there, you have to pay $1 a month. If you wanted to sign on, get it, download it, and, and log off again, that's fine. But at least you help pay for part of the cost in developing it. And that's the, the Patreon page. I'm also on Patreon, as was mentioned a moment ago. So that's, um, that's how you can support some non-orthodox work in economics, which the world desperately needs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Keen. Uh, so now I'm joined by Emeritus Professor Sutipan Chiratiwa um, to provide some comments. Uh, Professor Sutipan is uh, the Executive Director of the ASEAN Studies Centre and Chairman of uh, Chula Global Network here at Chula Kong University. Um, he's held uh, advisory positions to various ministries in Thailand, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Commerce. Um, his academics interests range from international trade and investment to finance, regional integration and development. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, Ajahn Khan, and thank you for the invitation. I think uh, there's a number of organizers involved in this event uh, with uh, the music of prominent uh, professor mm -hmm. here uh, in person. And uh, as much as all of you, I have just... Sorry, my press the wrong button. That's okay. <laughs> okay, all right. I have just a chance to uh, listen to, to you uh, uh, very... Uh, a provoking, uh, fascinating uh, presentation, as well as uh, you know, uh, thought provoking. I think is uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of food for thought, mm -hmm. and it even I'm sure that a lot of people in the room might not be economists per se, you know, in terms of training. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that uh, there's a lot uh, that will leave upon a lot of uh, questions mm -hmm. on uh, what you just said. Uh, 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 even for myself, I said that I may not be the best person, you know, to give comments. Uh, although, of course, we are training economics, but this area of economic, you mentioned, you know, the uh, monetary and macroeconomics, has become another animal, even among the economists themselves. You know, they're looking at mm. question about the how uh, uh, macroeconomic being thought. Try to say that uh, mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of missing links with the uh, real world reality, and uh, that's why I think is uh, uh, this particular lecture is, is also uh, very uh, important to so-called uh, your your book debunking mm -hmm. economics or debunking uh, macroeconomics uh, as a way we. Uh, they, they see how the uh, modern economy uh, function, uh, particularly in the area of how uh, money creation uh, uh, be doing, uh, uh, debt uh, creation as well, and, and down to you know the the, the really need of the uh, credit and, and, and banking business and all that. So I think it's uh, 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 that's why I think it's uh, for sure. Uh, one of the lessons that I would say that uh, 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 we always say as well that uh, uh, don't believe uh, everything what economists say on okay. the economics uh, or on the economy. So you have to have really the, the, the critical mind in order to understand. And, uh, and that's the very first one, and particularly also uh, that related if you come into the whole construction of the modeling economics that you perform very well. In order to counter argument, it's not easy for non-economist training mm -hmm. if you uh, don't have the uh, economic training. It's not that easy to come to counter with the uh, kind of economists if you mm -hmm. don't have the kind of construction. So uh, in a way, that's why uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in order to uh, debunking, you know, economic as such, uh, your works, uh, you know, along the way, I uh, get it that the two pieces uh, of work that uh, at least uh, Carl uh, handed to me, you know, about uh, debunking economics and also the, the Minsky modeling of the Great uh, Moderation and the Great Recession, which is resolved more or less the, the, the last. Uh, a global financial crisis, 2007, 2008. It's important work that mm. uh, I, I, I read in between, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, what, uh, the last two days, <laughs> in order to understand more what uh, the message mm -hmm. and the, the topic of this discussion, you know, why uh, money and uh, uh, we call the debt matter to economics to, uh, you know, the, the, the disequilibrium. Uh, question, you know, that's why the economy is so obsessed, you know, with equilibrium. Why? Because they like to, uh, you know, take the so-called like the, how the, the market can take care of itself. Mm. Uh, you know, the, 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 the notion of the market to take care of itself uh, by neoclassical economics. And, uh, and the thing behind uh, the idea is whatever the, uh, the, the money supply demand, you know, whenever it's off the balance to some kind of disequilibrium, if you come back to it itself, I mean, by some kind of the economic mechanism, 
and uh, uh, you try to prove otherwise. It may not be possible in modern world with the, uh, the, the, the three monetary arrangements. The first one, of course, is the sailor, the classical one, you know, uh, you offer the money, you know, you have the demand, you know, uh, supply demand, you take care of yourself, you know, and then yeah. by, uh, let's say, the so-called, before we have the more the uh, uh, speculation economy, or the modern one after the World War II, we used to also looking at more uh, the, 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 the secondary arrangement, uh, you mentioned about the loanable fund and the sector, you know, the yeah. relation between the sector one and sector two and, and how, you know, the money creation. Uh, we started talking about how the central bank take care, you know, of the, uh, what you call the banking system, uh, commercial banks, and investment, modern day would be investment bank, uh, uh, all that kind of question, you know, we take care by the, the, the second monetary uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, but it's only the, the third uh, monetary arrangement, if I understand that the, the how bank lending create money is, is beyond uh, rich. Uh, you know, if you're not going to uh, so-called understand really how the central bank really works. Mm. And that's why I think one of the principles that you try to also uh, bring into the question is mm. You have to really understand the really the accounting uh, system yeah. of the banking system, how uh, that work in practice. And this is, uh, uh, you know, if you are a macroeconomist uh, uh, writing textbook, you will not be able to understand the double book entry and, and how the money creation be done. Uh, even I, I remember, even Bernanke himself, you know, you right yeah. mentioned that about him when he came into power, you know, after, I mean, uh, to, to taking the, 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 the central bank, uh, uh, the, the, the federal reserve. Uh, one of the uh, things that he tried to mention is also that we need to see, uh, uh, because already uh, by the time he came to, to the, the central bank, it's already crisis, you know, the 2007, 2008, and he said, well, uh, he not quite known what's happening, you know, that's uh, about the loanable fund, mm. about the how, you know, that's, uh, you, you, you mentioned about the uh, uh, monet, uh, monetary instability, uh, means department, he uh, not quite recognized how uh, big spread, mm. you know, uh, we're talking about the Notable funding the system in the U.S. So you need to see all these kind of things and, and see all the accounting uh, system and how that done. We should be beyond the, even the central bank. You know that uh, even before it's uh, we understand it's a green span, you know uh, irrational exuberance. Uh, we yeah. are, it's more or less a neoclassical per se and then not no looking at it. I think the, 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 the third monetary arrangement you mentioned, you know, so that's why uh, housing loans and all that, you know, and hold the whole system. Uh, one thing that uh, I think here, perhaps uh, if uh, might help, because here we're talking uh, very much about the uh, financialization, we're talking mm. a lot about the, uh, you know, the, the, the capital flow, you know, that's uh, perhaps how your model, because we're talking macroeconomists themselves, they try to look at the open macroeconomics. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is something that you not mentioned. Yeah. I think it's important. It is very. That they also trying to improve their own modeling system in order to have a better uh, forecast, and and that's how that evolved. Later on, we're talking from the 80s and 90s about the financial globalization, you know, the crisis from one place and spread into another place. So you're right to say about the, uh, uh, our own Asian financial crisis. Uh, uh, we used to, uh, you know, that uh, uh, showing your model, I mean, we, uh, the predictability is all right. You know, we always say it's important about the more, more the predictability. Uh, it's right, that's about that. We should be able to predict the crisis, yeah. uh, that double mismatches in the 
in our system. You know, we uh, borrow uh, short, but the return, you know, mm. the loan that will be long, that's one. And another thing is, uh, there's also uh, the, the second mismatch is you, uh, in such an open macroeconomics, uh, like Thailand, we uh, borrow a lot from abroad mm. because of interest difference, uh, different form. You know, borrowing costs mm. uh, in the system is much higher, the interest is much higher. So that's why uh, even I remember at the time, at Central Bank, you know, that uh, at the time, they not be able to either define, or have you write the next part, you know, that they don't know how, uh, you know, the, the, the foreign loans be, yep. uh, you know, that's uh, how the, the, the private debt, let's say the, the private debt uh, or loans by uh, uh, companies, how big they are from abroad, mm. from Hong Kong or Singapore and all that. So they spend time with IMF and, and World Bank, whatever, after the crisis to clean them, to look at the size of the debt. So they, they become more. Yeah, they... Then... So that's something, uh, you know, even in the fragile economy and a small economy like Thailand, you know, they, uh, for sure, uh, that's a lot of the lesson learned for policy makers. Uh, uh, about this uh, financial crisis, and I, I agree that perhaps uh, visual improve uh, uh, Minsky uh, modeling that you try to uh, uh, make it like uh, the, the handy one, you know, that uh, uh, if anyone would like to go into that uh, for, you know, that's, uh, and, 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 and I find it interesting because um, uh, when we talking about the, uh, because economists these days, <laughs> and I talk to Professor Jarrett, you know, they, they tend to have their own corner, their own modeling, you know. That, mm. uh, so very often, if you, uh, the, the meeting among uh, the old classical economists, what they we ask first, you know, about what, what's your work, you know, mm. what model do you use, you know, that's kind of thing, you know. So that's a very first question that we ask. Uh, about uh, what kind of model do you use mm. to, to work on this? Because uh, that's something that is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, 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 is that, that the part of the training that uh, you need to to have the rigorous uh, mathematical and, 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 and say what what is like. So uh, I'm not going to uh, go any further uh, about the. Uh, my further comment, and uh, I agree that the economics need to, uh, while well, you say the grown up, of course, embrace in this area the distribution, you know. But I think you know, in, 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 in many other areas, uh, not only the, the area of the uh, dynamic, like uh, any other discipline, we still uh, need to improve in growing up. Of course, I understand that the, the, the dynamic side, they always refer to the static and dynamic, but it's not the dynamic, it's still not that dynamic in the sense that you seem to be integrated uh, uh, the reality of the modern world, and but in this case about the, uh, about the depth, about the money creation, about the, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, how a uh, bank uh, doing their job. So, uh, so very much agree that uh, we need to also not only go back to the uh, some kind of the, uh, uh, in, in, in economic training, uh, history of economic uh, ideas, economic history of economic thought, which is a bit forgotten because uh, modern training economic will go directly to uh, what do you call the macroeconomic training or microeconomic training as foundation and mm. you tend to forget the big idea, the political economy that been support for the 19th century uh, uh, that you try to show, mm. you know, some of the business say or Varas or and the Dao uh, uh, Jupiter, you know, that's a public mm. Aminsky. You pick up uh, some interesting, what do you call the uh, pathway to show how even uh, the uh, classical economists uh, before their classical could be useful and uh, could uh, uh, also help to 
you know, to help uh, create the, the, the modeling exercise such yeah. uh, for the tradition of uh, uh, neoclassical economies that we have done. Mm. So uh, uh, that's, that's a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just very, very, very quickly. I think um, it's the idea you mentioned the point of the neoclassical vision: the market can solve everything, uh, and that's very much how they think. But what they again leave out of their thinking, and this applies to Austrian economists as well, is they imagine it's everything about flows, even though they handle flows very badly. They don't consider accumulation of stocks that can make it difficult. And of course, the clear stock I'm talking about here is the stock of debt. And if you have a series of cycles that accumulates more debt, which is what Minsky added to Schumpeter, you can get into a position where, given the compounding of debt, the market can't solve that. And this is this was Fisher's point, that if you have a massive level of private debt and then you expect the private sector to reduce that level of private debt by going bankrupt or by banks closing down, the reduction in debt can exceed the reduction, can actually be smaller than the reduction in GDP and the debt trap can get worse. So the private sector can't get itself out of these difficulties. You need to have a government sector as well. You need to have other, other non-market interventions to make the economy work. And that's the ignorance about the role of stocks, I think, is an important element in the flaws of neoclassical economics. Uh, that they're sure that they, they, their little vision about the market can solve everything is completely wrong. Again, understanding accounting. I didn't do accounting at university. I learnt the importance of accounting by designing Minsky. So the double entry bookkeeping elements and all that has come out of realising just how essential that is to understand monetary dynamics. And then once you have that, it should really be a foundation of our thinking. So we need to learn a lot more from accountants. They need to learn from economists as well, monetary economists, not neoclassical ones. Uh, but yeah, there's, there needs to be a, a two-way street there. Uh, the open macro economy is extremely important. I thought I'd show you a, uh, Indonesia's situation here just um, by uh, just changing the, my, my, pro, my data program here. And you can see the impact of the Asian financial crisis so vividly and the open macro economy side of that for Indonesia because because its private debt levels weren't too bad until the crisis. And then the dramatic increase in the ratio is because of the collapse of the currency. And then you had a dramatic change. Credit went from being fairly trivial, only about 10 to 15 percent of GDP, to 80, 90 percent, and down to minus 50. So that's the open macro economy side of the tragedy for Indonesia of the financial crisis. Uh, but equally, uh, I can do. It. I'm just using Indonesia there. That's that's looking at the developing economy side of the world. If I make this, the change and go, let's look at America. And look at this so-called black swan called the financial crisis. There it is. And the correlations of credit with unemployment and employment in America. That's the correlation with unemployment and credit. So again, all these things, they're, they're not black swans. They're black swans because neoclassical economists have blinkers over their eyes and can't see them. Okay? They're white swans you're looking at with a black mask on your face. And, uh, and finally, the 19th century economists think that's quite true. Roma talked about macroeconomics going backwards in the last 30 years. Even neoclassical economics has gone backwards in the last 130 years. So you're better off reading Volra and Marshall and Jevons than you are reading anybody in the 20th century. At least the mistakes that Jevons and Volras made can be excused by the state of mathematical knowledge at the time and the state of empirical data. The mistakes the 20th century have made are to, are to retreat from things that they, mathematical conclusions they did not want to reach. So yes, learn the, don't, don't read anything in the 20th century by neoclassical economists. Forget it. It's a waste of time. Let alone the 21st century, which is even worse. <laughs> Just one point uh, I forgot to, to mention about mm -hmm. the, the, the issue about inequality. Oh, yeah. Very interesting uh, on, 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 on top of your work on following the, the, the Minsky uh, yeah. tradition. It's about the, uh, 
the, how the private debt uh, can, you know, particularly the, the crisis also, you know, seem to be like uh, you, you show that the bankers, yeah, mm. you know, the, 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 the financial sector uh, gain more than the rest. That yeah. Mean the real sector, even the, if you use the words like capitalists, that's been the producers or whatever entrepreneurs, uh, and as well as uh, income earners, you know, like uh, employees. So how, how uh, because it's, uh, you know, that's, uh, well, yeah, no, no, overall it's bankers in Thailand say it's, it's, it's a more, but and then and, 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 and that's helped to I mean that's even uh, uh, you know, pushing more for, for different let's say the inequality. I think this is interesting the yeah. implication that, for from the yeah. study. That actually was what's called a complex uh, an emergent property of the model because as I've said this particular model is derived straight from definitions. There's no ideology in there, any sense. It's just if you, if you put the definitions and differentiate them and then put the model together and don't, don't suppress non-equilibrium results, just look at the overall behaviour. You see this result that even though I've got the firms borrowing the money, the capitalists cycle around an equilibrium level. It's not an equilibrium rate of profit, by the way. It's an equilibrium ratio, relationship between investment and profit. Um, their, their, their level remains constant as the level of private debt rises. It's the workers who see their level of, um, of... I'll just actually change the pointer here. It's the workers who are paying for it, the increased inequality. And that's something which has emerged from the model itself. It's not something which was built into the assumptions. So that's, that's the, again, the importance of complex systems. You will learn things about the world from a mathematical complex systems point of view, that you even people like Minsky didn't anticipate this, because Minsky did talk about uh, stability lead to in, leading to instability. He did talk about rising levels of private debt. He didn't realise that workers would be the ones paying for it, and that came out of a simple mathematical model. But it's a mathematical model in nonlinear dynamics and complex systems, not the crap that neoclassicals use. Thank you. So we have time for some questions now. Uh, maybe we can take them in rounds of three. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? I have, I have three questions. <laughs> uh, maybe you can take one at a time. Okay. And we'll, uh, That'll three. help, yeah. Uh, so the first one's uh, more of an economics question. If we understand inflation as too much money chasing too few real resources, how have uh, neoclassical economists at central banks uh, who failed to recognize bank originated money and debt, been so successful at hitting their inflation targets, even with repeated QE programs, quantitative easing programs. Yeah, um, they they weren't successful hitting their monetary targets. Capitalism was going through a deflationary spiral, and they took credit for it. And in, indeed, like uh, this particular model, I, I just to actually illustrate that with the Minsky model. If I go back over here, let's just see. Um, I'll bring up one of the models, because uh, that model doesn't include price dynamics, so I can't actually talk about um, price dynamics with those models. But when I generalise it and work with a, uh, with a model that includes price dynamics, and again, exactly the same story, deriving it just by differentiation, not um, by any, any uh, ideological setting. If I run this model, look at what happens to the price level. Let's see, we're at an inflation rate here. Ah, pardon me. I've, Whacked an extra element there I didn't intend putting in. I'll just delete that. Okay. This model has price dynamics as well. Ah, uh, pardon me. Pardon? Oh, pardon me, sorry. This, this model is built by taking exactly the same approach that I did with the other models, differentiating the debt ratio, the wages share, and the employment rate, but it includes prices in the models and uses a flow of supply and a flow of demand to illustrate the price, the, uh, price setting. When I do it, pardon me, is it one of the hassles with it? Okay, there's the inflation rate. Now it's heading down towards zero, going negative. So deflation is one of the tendencies in a capitalist economy when you have a rising level of private debt. So the neoclassicals could credit what was being caused by the things they were ignoring, as usual. And then QE itself, QE uh, doesn't inject money into the real economy. As my good friend Michael Hudson puts the idea, QE, the helicopter in QE dropped money on Wall Street, not Main Street. 
of that inflated asset prices, which is what they give them a credit for this, pardon the pun. At least with QE, what they were trying to do in America was inflate asset prices and they succeeded. How did they do it? They threw a trillion dollars a year of money at the financial sector and returned for a trillion dollars worth of worthless bonds back in the opposite direction. And then with a trillion dollars of additional cash per year, the financial sector had to buy assets. No point buying bonds because they were being bought, net bought by the Federal Reserve anyway. So you buy shares, what happens? The share prices treble. And what does that do? Increase inequality because people with existing shares of the wealthy, they got the extra money. So you got huge asset price inflation and a small of money out of that, out of banker fees and stuff like that, dribbled into the real economy. So maybe out of a trillion dollars a year, the real economy saw maybe a hundred or two hundred billion dollars a year, depending on how many yachts and so on the, the brokers were buying. As, as it's always the case, it's the brokers who get the yachts, not the brokers' customers. Um, so there they caused inflation, but they caused inflation in asset prices, not in the real world. Second question. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll go yeah. Yeah. back and forth to Frank and others. So, uh, Ashan. Where's the key? That's your lecture brought me back to my school days. <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. A long time ago, when I was at Cambridge in the ah. six, early 60s. Then it was a very good thing. Late 60s. So, I wasn't reading camps through neoclassical eyes, obviously. <laughs> Because at Cambridge we don't. But anyway, it's good that for, for, me, for me to have heard this lecture because I think uh, at the time of the financial crisis 2008 and so on, uh, I wasn't doing macro or monetary economics when I was teaching here. So I felt, nevertheless, that the, the stuff that the faculty was trying to uh, teach to our students must be the wrong things because it, all the, the things that people, the, the, the banks were, were actually doing, were all against what the textbook was saying. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I felt that we should have burnt all these monetary economics textbooks and really think, do, do something with them. Because uh, the, the faculty is part of the academic uh, circle, so it can't really uh, behave any differently. Mm. So my question is, uh, given that uh, the, the, the assumptions, the definitions, etc., the, that goes into the double, double entry bookkeeping, mm. uh, seems to be the really fundamental thing. And the, the models that that are created out of these assumptions uh, are more or less things that uh, the world goes by because because in, in the end uh, accounts have to balance and, and debt has to be repaid and so on and so forth. Mm. What implications do you think do this have on the teaching of the economics these days? Yeah. Well, the basic uh, implication of the teaching of economics is it needs to change completely. The rethinking economics movement, uh, I think, is a very polite way of saying that everything in mainstream economics is wrong and we need to start all over again. So the whole idea of basing the, uh, building macro from micro, that's intellectually wrong. That uh, is based on thinking you can extrapolate from the individual to the collective what you can't do. They ignore money, which is essential. They ignore equal disequilibrium, which is essential. Uh, there's so many things that are wrong. I would like to rebuild economics, starting from people like Schumpeter, Minsky, and Marx, uh, rather than the neoclassicals, who are... Uh, the one thing you can say about neoclassical economics is it's proved it's wrong over time, and that most of the decisions the classical school of economics made were the correct ones, analysing in terms of social classes, that type of thing which is completely left out of the neoclassicals. Uh, they ignore social classes by talking in terms of agents, you know, consumer agents and producing agents, not workers and capitalists and bankers. Uh, and that sense you may be meant to mention earlier of um, reading the classics. If you look at Ricardo, 
his major objective politically was to was to eliminate the landlord class, which he saw as parasites on the capitalists. In that sense, the bankers are the parasites of today, and we need to have an insight into that and in saying we shouldn't get, let them get too big, which we've let do. And neoclassical theory played a major role in all that. So we need to really completely rethink the teaching and the, the foundations of economics. I'm going to get a chance to ask you all the questions I want tonight, Steve. But somebody's uh, trying to watch this on Facebook and then tweet me okay. a question. Um, I'll try and simplify it as much as possible. Um, this is really two, three questions in one. Um, can you address whether uh, money leaves an economy if a country is, is running a trade deficit, uh, which is basically mm. something you and Warren Martin have discussed? Uh, do an extension for that, do governments have to run budget deficits um, because MMT seems to ignore this and MMT bookkeeping seems to be seems to be wrong on this and Mosler is saying that uh, Clinton administration should have run budget surpluses when the private sector was running deficit and that doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah, I mean that's one I've been in I sorry, pardon me, yeah. I find myself supporting one the foundations of modern monetary theory and disagreeing with two other elements of modern monetary theory. And that is, what, first of all, the argument that they, they say that um, um, they ignore, even though sectoral balance analysis includes a trade deficit, they pretty much say that exports are a cost and imports are a benefit. And I think that's a nonsense application of neoclassical thinking. Uh, whether it came from neoclassical thought or not in the first instance, it may have come from Warren Mosler just coming up with that with little exports are a cost, imports are a benefit, uh, and then they use opportunity cost to justify it. That is nonsense in macroeconomics. And they also then say, well, all, you know, the, the money doesn't actually change hands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the end of the analysis, if an exporter makes an export sale to an importer, the bank balance of the exporter will rise in the exporter's currency, the bank balance of the importer will fall in the importer's currency. There is a change in the monetary stocks, whether or not money actually flows from one country to another. It'll cause dynamics that matter, and we need to include that. So I think they'd get rid of this exports for a cost and imports for a benefit stuff. Okay, it is it is an injection of what is essentially neoclassical thought into a sound foundation of monetary macroeconomics. That's what we need. And then also there's a belief in modern monetary theory, which again I think comes out of the areas where it doesn't analyse. For example, I wouldn't read modern monetary theorists to work out the role of energy in production. I'd read myself and Tim Garrett on that front. Uh, there are areas they haven't addressed. The actual production technology that is an area that they haven't addressed. They should, and they can, and it can be done and made consistent with it. But a lot of those areas is... So modern monetary theory does a very important job of saying what we think about money creation in general is wrong, and I completely agree with them on that front. When it comes to the role of the government as well, they're quite correct that the government is one way, not the only way, but one way of creating net financial assets. Because if, you, if the government spends money on you, it doesn't give you a bill for the spending. Okay? If a bank gives you money, it gives you a bill for the money. So there's no increase in your net money free assets from borrowing from a bank, but there is from the government spending more than it gets back in taxation. And if you think about uh, the one thing modern monetary theory says quite regularly is that um, uh, if the private sector has a desire to net save, the only way it can net save is that the government net dissavers. And that's true. Okay? Now, if you think about all of us would like to have more assets and liabilities. But if you think in an accounting sense and say, because one person's asset is another person's liability, the sum of assets minus liabilities in the aggregate is zero. So if one part wants to have positive savings, which is the private sector, some other sector has to have negative savings, which is the government sector or the foreign sector. So in that sense, if you're not running a trade surplus, you're going to have to have a government running a deficit, uh, 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 spending more than it gets back in taxation. Otherwise, the private sector will be in deficit. Now, if the private sector is in deficit, it will borrow from the banking sector, buy assets, and drive up the price of assets. That will look like you've got positive assets because you multiply the total stock of outstanding assets by the price the last one sold for, and that gives you a apparent 
surplus, you've got a positive assets coming out of that. So long as the level of sales of assets doesn't rise, because if more people try to dump their assets on the market at once, the price will collapse. And that's a, this is the boom and slump stuff we get ourselves caught up in. So even Austrian economists, if they want to have people with net financial assets, which is what they believe everybody, everybody has, need the government to be creating money. Now all these issues I think we need to get sorted out over time. Uh, and modern monetary theory has done a very important job of establishing the validity of thinking about money in this sense and seeing the role of government creating money. But it's thrown in two very bad curlies, let's uh, with one, about the role of a trade surplus. And I think a trade surplus, a country running a trade surplus, is generating net financial assets for itself out of that, which gives it an insulation that a country running a trade deficit does not have. Or the other option has become the global, global currency, which is what the Americans did. And I think in that sense, that's why I say I think MMT is too American-centric. They can run indefinite trade deficits because they produce the global currency. But we're, we're seeing very, the very early days now of a number of countries saying we've had enough of America, particularly, I've got to mention him, Trump, okay, <laughs> weaponizing America's mon uh, monetary system uh, by banning Iran using SWIFT and things like that. Now we're seeing the beginning of countries saying Let's, we need to form an alternative to the American dollar. Um, so maybe we're seeing the beginning of the breakdown of that global hegemony. Uh, but all these things, we need to consider them seriously. MMT provides the foundation for doing it, but I think it's thrown in one wrong, very bad wrong element on thinking about the role of the trade surplus as well. And I explained that in a tweet by saying to Steve Rightborn is wrong. That'd help. Yeah, that's a friendship. It'd be really improved by that. <laughs> Other questions? We have two more waiting here, but we'll try and balance them out. Mm. Okay, one from Frank to give you time. And then... All right, this is a politically hard question. And it ties into what you mentioned about Trump and how, how we got Trump. Um, a, lot, a large amount of people were uh, unhappy with the system and then just voted for Trump. And we can kind of assume that that was because of the great financial crisis and people never recovered from that. So how do we avoid uh, these cycles of credit and private debt expansion um, <clears throat> without either designing some sort of Veblen Soviet of engineers or returning to Keynesian full employment, which um, proved to be a pretty good system for um, fending off fascist rises and, and uh, great depressions. For, uh, from 46 to 67 or whatnot. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we got, a large part of why we got Trump was uh, the deindustrialization of America that was the basis of the industrialization of Asia. And the, that, that deindustrialization occurred because American transnationals were quite happy to shaft their workers by moving production offshore and exporting back under the, tr the um, preferential tra tariff agreements that America had uh, with countries like China, of course, which is now trying to reverse. And uh, China's industrialization in particular meant that the jobs that American workers who used to vote Democrat uh, were got sent offshore to China, and I'm sure a lot of Chinese would happily vote Democrat after that proceedings, and Trump has now grabbed them as Republicans because rather than having jobs in factories and having some dignity out of that, they're either unemployed on welfare or working as security guards uh, for the wealthy in America and getting terrible wages and disgusting treatment for their union negotiators, as you know from personal experience. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that is what gave us Trump. So to get out of it, I, I think, again, because a, Part of it, you have to have a national approach to development rather than basing on trade. I think investment is the basis of growth, not trade and specialisation. So we need to change our thinking on that. The work being done by the um, uh, Atlas of Economic Complexity Group at MIT, oh sorry, at Harvard, pardon me, is very important on that front as a way of looking at how one develops an economy. It's, it's not trade that does it, it's, in, it's investment. And they've got a very good idea of saying how you could actually use that for a developing economy. Have you seen the Atlas of Economic Complexity or not? Okay, I'll bring it up on screen here. Hang on. Do I have a browser running? No, I don't. Okay. 
That's what I do. Good. Okay. Hoping I'm still online here. Very low signal. I'm running up Frank's internet bill here. Okay, can't be reached. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to manage to get it up on screen, but that's the site, atlas.cid.harvard.edu. Just search for Atlas of Economic Complexity and you'll find this database. And it's using the SICT database, SITC database, pardon me, to try to analyse what different economies produce where there are holes in their industrial structure and where they can join the dots effectively to build new industrial components. That's a way of thinking about industrialization. And then the other side is we need to write off the level of private debt. And we can do that by using what I call a modern debt jubilee because just as private banks create money, so can the central bank. We've seen that with QE. But rather than using that money to inflate asset prices, we could have used it to democratise share ownership by giving everybody who has a bank account money directly, so QE for the people, but then saying, well, if you, don't, if you have debt, the debt's reduced. If you don't have debt, you've got to buy new shares, new shares which are used to cancel corporate debt. That could have democratised share ownership, as well as reducing the level of both household and corporate debt. And then we have to see the private level, the level of private debt is an important economic indicator, at least as important as the rate of inflation, probably more important as a target to keep that in the, a safe range because we do need a certain amount of private debt to finance investment, to finance consumption items that workers can't afford to buy out of their pay, paychecks, things like cars and houses, motorbikes and so on. So the, the credit sector plays an important role at that point. That's when it's a facilitator, but don't let it become a parasite. So we, we could use the, the government's money creation capability through the central bank to stop the private sector level of debt getting out of higher hand. We need to make society more, if you like, a more of a debtor's society than a creditor's society. At the moment, creditor's rights are enforced by literally everything. Debtor's rights don't exist. We need to change that around. And this is where work by Michael Hudson on the role of debt jubilees in ancient society, including Jesus as a anti-debt campaigner, a campaigner for a debt jubilee. That's, that's, we need to realise the danger of having too much debt, the danger of accentuating creditors' rights over debtors' rights, and the sort of social breakdown that leads to. Uh, those are part of the things we need to get to and to build those into how we think about capitalism. Maybe I can follow up with this question. Um? So you've made quite clear that banks are very powerful players in society, mm. and you've been kind of hinting at different ways that they should be reformed. But mm. Could you focus more specifically on the banks? How should they be transformed? Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, firstly, we have to regard debt. Money creation is simple. Okay? It doesn't take brains to have money to create money. It takes brains to create a car, or build a building, or make a computer. Uh, to be, create money, all you need is a banking license. And that's not something you get because you're a great inventor. You get a banking license because the government regulators approve your application to get a banking license. And then, given, like, if you got a banking license by raising, uh, say, a billion baht and then establishing a bank, if you're willing to have a 10 to 1 ratio, you can create 10, you know, 10 billion baht out of that. And then you have a levered society. And then the temptation is to make, rather than gambling on innovators, why not take a, a sure bet on property? And you get property bubbles coming out of it. So all this stuff is, the, 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 the capacity to create money is a socially granted right, not something which comes out of your okay, brilliant mind. And we need to say that right comes with responsibilities. And then equally, society has to temper the dangers of that right. If you allow too much debt creation and you let it going for the wrong things, you will have a financial crisis. So you get from seeing bankers as being powerful and you know masters of the universe as they used to think of themselves, 
and get them back to being servants again, that's a huge change in orientation. I think you also have to prevent them financing asset bubbles. So one thing I would, one of the ways they do that is they pretend to base the amount of lending they're doing on the income of the borrower. Uh, and then they inflate the income of the borrower and reduce the borrower's costs and get away with absolute blue murder. And I want to show a brilliant example of this, which has come up in Australia through the Royal Commission into Banking that has occurred just recently, because a range of documents have been exposed by the Royal Commission into how the banks actually decided the amount of debt they'd create. And this is just an outrageous piece of stuff from the, from the uh, National Australia Bank. I'll just actually zoom in and show this, and if I can get it to zoom in. So this is what they call the household expenditure model that they use to decide how much somebody could be lent given the income that they had. And just uh, this, this document has, what if a couple is earning $400,000 a year, more a year? That's about 300,000 American dollars, okay? Let's, let's work in Australian terms. That's a lot of money. Now there's, if you're earning 400,000 a year, then after tax you're earning at least 250000 per year, which means about $20,000 a month. How much do they estimate you spend? Less than 20%. They're assuming on that income level you have a, a, a savings rate of 80%. Therefore you can afford to put 80% of your income towards servicing a mortgage, which is total garbage. Now look at the two numbers there. 3716 for a couple with no children, 3924 per month, as expenditure for a couple with one child. That means they're assuming you can raise a child in Sydney for $7 a day. You can't buy them a hamburger for $7 a day. Okay? There's even parts in the table where the numbers go negative. Okay? It costs you less to have four kids than it does to have three. Now this is this is this is institutional fraud. No other way to describe it. Fraudulent behaviour. Now, they got away with it because they're allowed to say they're basing the uh, level of debt on the income of the borrower and then they'll, the, 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 the clear income, the net income, and then they make this garbage to justify it. So what we have to say, well, in future, we won't let you do that. And one rule I would bring is what I call property income limited leverage. I'd say that there's a maximum amount of let debt that can be lent against a particular asset based not on the income of the asset of the of the borrowers, but on, on the income of the asset itself. So I'd put a ceiling of, for example, saying the maximum amount of money you could lend to buy a property would be ten times its annual rental income. Now that would given the level of bubble lending in countries like Australia, that would reduce the level of possible debt for buying an asset by a factor of three. And that would give you far less asset inflation. And then it could be easily enforced because statisticians work out imputed rents and actual rents in virtually every postcode in every country in the world. And you could then say that if you were, if you were competing with Paul to buy a property in, in Bangkok, at the moment Paul had, you, you, Paul had beat you because you've got a higher income unless you get a high level of leverage. So you're going to go and get, you'll be happy to take a loan of 120% of the prop, of your property value, Paul wouldn't go beyond 30. If I put the rule in, neither of you could go beyond 30. And therefore, the one who'd win the contest wouldn't be the one who got the higher leverage, it'd be the one who saved more money. Okay? So rules like that that stop banks inflating the level of lending, and also, on the positive side, banks at the moment won't lend to entrepreneurs because they don't have... If they lend to an entrepreneur, five out of six are going to go bankrupt. They lose all their money, they get interest on one. I'd rather enable banks to take what I'll call equity, uh, ec entrepreneurial equity loans or EELs, where they lend and take an equity position. So it's like combining venture capital with, um, with existing banking. And then they might lose money on five, but they'll make a fortune on the six because the value of the shares will rise. And then again, I'd also support crowdfunding because um, the intelligence of Bankers used to have people who were experts on um, in engineering, experts on semiconductors and things like that to decide which firm to lend to. They don't bother anymore. They simply have people going out and checking out property prices. Okay, um, but 
we need to get those experts back again, but in some ways crowdfunding does that because people can look at crowdfunding and say, I really like that idea, I want to support it. I'd like to give people government-created money for the purpose of crowdfunding alone and then the people decide who they want to crowdfund and that gives you the intelligence of the crowd to make decisions about who should get the money rather than just the banks doing it. And if you don't make money, who cares? Okay? Because a large part, again, this comes with the wisdom of Schumpeter, that a large part of the success of capitalism is allowing failure without wiping you out. So with crowdfunding, if you lose money, it doesn't matter. If you make money, great. Okay? Putting money in the sacrosanct position rather than the innovation that money finances is a major part of why capitalism fails. Okay? If we put the focus on the entrepreneurial side, then it might succeed. In the financial crisis, don't you show that? Don't you show that's got a lot worse uh, in terms of financialisation since around about 1980? Ah, to yeah, totally. It's a total financial bubble. All the money's gone into the asset markets rather than into the real economy. And one thing, if you look at the work of Basil Moore, uh, who originated the endogenous money approach back in the 1970s, Basil's arguments about how banks create money focused on lines of credit because he said major corporations would negotiate lines of credit with banks. You might have 30 banks into a consortium providing a billion dollars line of credit to General Motors or General Electric, things like that. Over time, lines of credit almost disappeared because they're not particularly profitable for banks. So companies like General Motors and General Electric went from taking out lines of credit with banks to issuing short-term commercial paper to pay their wage bills and their supplier bills. And that's why the financial crisis, one of the reasons it was so severe in 2007, was that Lehman Brothers collapsed and Lehman Brothers had cornered the market for short-term uh, corporate bonds. And the people who let Lehman fail didn't realise that. So suddenly, within weeks, American corporations could have been unable to pay wages and even more importantly, supplier costs. They couldn't give a shit about the workers. Um, but that that's... That weakness of the banking sector shows that they've gone from providing lines of credit, which is working capital for existing corporations, that's a good thing, to ignoring it. So the banking sector is not even doing the, what, cap, what Schumpeter thought banking was there for, which is to provide working capital for corporations and money for entrepreneurs. So let the banking sector become completely corrupted and distorted. We need to say, you guys need to be confined because the power to create money is such a huge power, it can be wielded irresponsibly very easily by stupid people who would think they're intelligent. Thank you. Other questions? We have one more waiting here, but we have to balance with that. Can I say one quick thing, really quick. Okay. <coughs> and that is for the benefit of everybody in the room. Steve is going to hate this. Um, but Dr. Sidney Pound made a really good point earlier about how um, what difficulty for everybody in understanding what's wrong with economics is that, you know, it's written by economists in economic language and economic models and economic assumptions, and it's very difficult for ordinary people to understand that. Um, Steve's two main books, um, I'd characterize them. If you look at Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis, it's probably going to take you two hours to read. Anybody can read it. You don't have to be an economist. It's something that is very accessible from that industry. Uh, and it's probably 150 pages or something like that. 100, 127. 127, okay. Not, not including the index. It's a really easy, it's a really easy read. Debunking is something that is, I don't know, it's probably 400 pages, but it feels like all Closer to 600. Okay, yeah. it, took me, it took me months to read. If you want something heavy, heavy and academic, and you want quite a lot of maths, and you want... No equations, but logical maths. <laughs> It's, it's a heavier academic, much more difficult read. So depending on what you're, what you're looking for, if you're looking for those um, complex academic arguments, debunking is, is for you, uh, it's, a, it's hard for me. Uh, if you're looking for an easy read that explains what goes on in the world and uh, you can do it a couple of hours, I would say um, can we call it this day. And that's, that's probably, you're probably shaking your head. No, no, I agree with you on that. You know, I mean, I've, I've got to apologise to my publisher because the Polity Books came up with the idea of that particular title, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? And the publisher, George 
who's a good friend, keeps on asking me to write another book, uh, to write a proposal called Economics Matters Because, which is going to be a book for high school students. And I keep on putting him off because I get more and more bloody, and I still haven't applied to an email for the last 10 days, my last excuse why I couldn't write the damn thing. But the can we avoid it was 25,000 words. That was it. That was the limit. And non-technical. And it really forced me to focus just on the issues themselves. And the reader's feedback that I got before I published it was also critical because I was communicating my anger about economics, but to an audience who wouldn't know why I was angry. Like one little simple illustration there was, I started off uh, talking about Minsky, saying how the most important event of the financial crisis of the, of the last 35 years is something that hasn't happened, which is the financial crisis. Then I went on to talking about Sargent and Lucas, and I realised people would just read the chronological and think, well, it must have been, the crisis must have been caused by the government sector. And getting readers' feedback pointed that out to me, and I wrote it for people who'd never read any economics at all, and I think that made it a lot much, much, much easier to read. So you're right, that is much... If you want to get an introduction to how I think about economics, then can we avoid it as a better starting point than debunking? But then you also work with comics and blogs and so on. I mean, if you, actually, because I'm also thinking in the same way that we talk about the accountability of the banks, it's also the accountability of the economists, both yeah. academics and other, way, other, other people. I wonder if you could say a little about how you see economists as being accountable to the right public. I, I think there's, if any profession is going to be responsible for the extinction of the human race, it'll be economists, <laughs> frankly. And like my, the reason I'm saying... Huh? The reason I'm saying that in particular is Nordhaus. I'm going to be... I've now decided to invent what I call the, the Nobel Prize in Economics, N-O-B-B-L-E. And if, nobbling is an English slang term about uh, winning a, a gambling on a horse race by making sure the favourite is drugged and therefore will fail and your, your horse will win. And, and so a nag wins and you make a fortune. That's what nobbling is. And the reason I'm saying it is because if you look at Nordhaus's work, See if I can find it here. He gets the Nobel Prize for supposedly bringing in climate change. But have a look at this. This is a 2017 paper by Nordhaus. Okay? 2016, published 2017. And he concludes that a six degree increase in temperature of the planet will reduce GDP by 8.5 per cent. Oh, pardon, I just knocked the screen out. There we go. Now, that is that is climate change denialism. And the reason he reached that conclusion, he has what he calls a damage function. And the damage function says the damage caused by rising temperature can be approximated by a quadratic not even a polynomial, just a second order polynomial, where the coefficient for the quadratic is 0 0.00267. So a one degree increase in GDP here, in temperature, he assumes, assumes okay, will cause a 0 0.00257 fall in GDP. You need to get to the stage of a 16 degree increase in temperature before he sees anything significant to a decline in GDP. Now, 6 degrees was the level of temperature that led to the Permian extinction. Wiped out about 90% of the species on the planet. And this is the crap, and that's being polite, that they call integrated assessment models that neoclassical economists have built. So in that sense, yes, they've got an enormous responsibility to humanity, and it's about time we brought them under control. I'm not an economist or an ecologist, but uh, I thought uh, maybe sometimes we all need to go back to our roots. You know? I mean, the term uh, ecology, I believe, as a root word from the Greek or oikos. Mm. Rokia means what ecology means study, right? So it's the study of your home or your environment. Yeah. Okay? And economy is the first part. It's also from oikos. Mm. Uh, so maybe, but uh, it's actually meaning what economics, I think, in the original sense is to manage the home, mm. right? Uh, so, and so maybe the, the term home economics came into about. Now, or maybe now if you talk about environmental economics, ecological economics, uh, but to me those are misnomers or redundants. People just don't, don't know what the original root word of that came from. 
if you are, uh, shall we say, intelligent economist, then you have to manage your own environment well, you know, your own home. Mm. Meaning now, you know, that we're talking about broader sense of environment. Of course, the environment that we are facing now is a great crisis. You know? um, so then uh, the other thing is, uh, like, for example, people are also questioning about GDP, whether that is a good measure of progress and development. Yeah? Mm. Um, and I can only say, maybe we need to re-examine uh, the, the alternatives, you know, measurements of social progress and mm. environmental progress, of which does not capture the GDP. I mean, very simply, for example, if you do volunteer work, or if, let's say, you're a homemaker, your contribution doesn't go up measured into GDP. GDP doesn't go up because you do volunteer work, mm. or you're a homemaker, but you're actually doing a lot of services. Mm. Whereas if you consume alcohol, you consume cigarettes, GDP goes up. Mm. So does that make sense or not? You know? So you have to go back. So maybe the best is to, just like what the, you know, the GDP, you know, in the Chinese, you're a Chinese, you know, they have a very, maybe a joke or whatever, because it sounds like in the Chinese it comes out as chicken part. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we need to re-examine that too. Um, and then, you know, nowadays with the sustainable development goals, with the mm. UN, right? The, you want to be those uh, you know, global achievement. I mean, these are all uh, very noble and aspirational, but, and then you have this term of leaving no one behind, right? Everybody mm. is now barging on this term. But actually, it's, uh, it's a myth. Because the implication here is that there's a, the system that creates we are now is actually leaving people behind. So unless you change the system, you will never have the leaving people behind mm. at all. Uh, so instead, we should think about leaving no one ahead. <laughs> Not even to bring it back. Mm. Uh, because it, it may sound a little bit anti-progress yeah, or anti-development. But it's actually what Gandhi says, that the rich have to live more simply so that the poor can simply live. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, a lot of things that need to be done. But I think the challenge now is um, this will require very monumental and insurmountable you know, reversals, mm. right? Uh, I mean, just like a car traveling at 100 miles per hour and it's approaching a cliff. And uh, how are you going to break and reverse course, you know? Mm. Uh, and the challenge is whether the human race has the ingenuity, uh, the, the urgency, and also the, you know, uh, the courage to make those abrupt changes. And if you look at negotiations going on in, let's say, like Brexit and things, I kind of doubt mm. at that stage. But is there still hope? Well, I, first of all, your point about uh, economics and ecology being integrated is another area I'm working on that's independent of the monetary work, but I'm going to build the monetary work in as well. So what I'm showing up here is uh, research I've been doing in the last couple of years with people working in energy economics and pointing out we have an economics models of production. And this is not just neoclassicals now, it's Marxists and post Keynesians as well. Models of production in which labor and energy, labor and capital can produce output without energy. But that's a complete myth. Okay? You can't produce anything without energy. So what I've realized recently is it's very, very simple. Again, mathematical logic coming to the rescue. Uh, the way that we've treated energy is to ignore it, or if we think about it, to bring in as the third factor along with labour and capital. But there's no such thing as a worker without energy or a machine without energy. And that's a little, the, what, what, the little insight got me to think about it. A machine without energy is a sculpture. A worker without energy is a corpse. So neither of them can actually exist or function without energy. And therefore, what they're doing is they're transforming energy into useful work. So the, the usual mathematical form that have been used in the past is to say output is a function of labour, capital and energy. But in fact, it's a function of labour using energy and capital using energy. And that completely changes the understanding of the mathematics. And it leads you to a positive definition of GDP because now rather than saying GDP is the sum of cigarette smoking and everything else, it's a range of human, um, uh, well, it's, it's a range of, of needs, okay? One of which is transportation. So for example, at the moment, the traffic jams in Bangkok are causing a rise in GDP as measured because we are spending more petrol to get from one point to another. Okay. But if you actually redefine transportation as motion of a mass from one point 
to another in a certain time, traffic jams reduce GDP. Okay? So you get a positive redefinition of GDP by focusing upon the role of energy. And then once you do that, once you have the once you include energy in there, you have the laws of thermodynamics also being considered. So we know when the laws of thermodynamics, disorder must increase. You can have localized areas where disorder decreases because you're using energy to do work, okay? but in the aggregate, you must be increasing disorder. And that turns out to these equations as well. If you look at the outputs, uh, they're less than the inputs. Again, this overturns the whole Marxist notion of surplus as well, because that means your waste is greater than your production. Must be. Now, therefore, you've got to think about the ecological impact of that. Okay, you can't ignore it. So the whole idea is to integrate economics and ecology at the hip, even deep, more deeply than that. And then we might have a proper analysis of the social system in which we live on the planet in which that social system is embedded. We have five minutes. Are there any really burning questions? I can throw one pop question here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Anthony. Well, obviously, you've done a great job. And I, I don't have uh, an understanding of background in economics, but um, you for the past 45 minutes or one hour, I, I just I have a question. I, I just begin to imagine uh, maybe in the cities, having cameras, maybe sitting down and making a presentation about uh, what Marxism might mean to the future mm. then, and how optimistic it was. I have listened to you and your presentation. You seem to have a lot of optimism in the um, Minsky uh, market as one of the best to, to actually understand the role of the bank mm. in um, their creation and when at the same time. I'm just imagining because um, uh, one of the quotes you put up in your PowerPoint was uh, a kind of analogy where a child starts from crawling and then working mm. and, and then you say what happened if uh, someday it becomes my job, but still crawling. And now, my question is, what happened to this Minsky modeling in the future mm. if it fails? But do you perceive any kind of limitations to this study or to the use of uh, the model in understanding the role of the planet? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think it comes back to one thing which has driven the backwards development of neoclassical economics, and that is that they're trying to find sound foundations for how they do economics, and they've chosen the wrong foundation. They thought you could use micro foundations to build macro, and that's led to all the nonsense we've seen today. I mean, if you take a look at how DSGE models are actually built, the absurd assumptions on which they're based are far worse than the stuff they had back in the 60s. Um, including having an unstable equilibrium they assume is stable. Mathematically insoluble, unstable equilibrium is part of the Ramsey model. And they then say, well, that explains how the consumers jump from one point to another across a mathematical phase space, which is just mathematically absurd. Um, so, but the, but the objective that there should be a sound foundation is, is valid. So my approach has been it's evolved over time as well, is that you can build macroeconomics from macroeconomics. That's why I show that particular model, the, the Minsky model. If you look at the, um, the terms I'm using, I think this is the right one, yeah. If you look at the terms I'm using there, um, these are all definitions put into dynamic format. But if I go across to the equations themselves, um, this one is saying the wage change is equal to, um, hang on, let's have a, find one of the right ones here. Or oh, defining the growth rate in terms of investment, capital share, et cetera, et cetera. They're all definitions put in dynamic form. They have, they're very hard to read at the moment. I won't try to elaborate them. But they're founded on actual definitions. So if the definitions are right and the extensions you build on that are simple, in a sense, and start simple, your foundations are going to be correct. It's what you leave out 
that's the important e element. Okay? Now, that then says, what have we left out, is the most important question. And I find that in terms of economic definition alone, income distribution, which is where the wage share turns up, employment, which is effectively talking about the level of economic uh, capacity utilisation, and then debt, which is talking about financialisation, those are your three essential elements. What's left out of that is the, the energy element, the ecological element. They're not included there. But they can then they can be. That's why I've done the work on energy recently because I knew that hole was there, and I finally plugged it a couple of years ago. The role of energy in production. Then once you've got that, you've got to include your, the thermodynamics. So it's getting a correct foundation is essential, and it's what the model doesn't include that tells whether it's weak or strong. So I'm trying to do it as best I can from the, solid, the most solid foundations possible. Understanding what we now know about complex systems and emergent properties. And that's, that's what I'm hoping will mean that I don't have to say at some point, my model's broken down and I can't answer the question. Yeah. If we could take two minutes for a final question, would that be okay for you? Yeah, sure. Okay, so, uh, okay, so for, we're just about to end our second semester uh, for the MAIDS program. And then we're all going to go off and, and write our theses. Mm. Um, <clears throat> during our first semester, the, the first uh, kind of public lecture we went to was about futures literacy. Are you kind of familiar with that? Where, no. Uh, it, we had a professor by the name of Rial Miller. Uh, he worked for the UN, UNESCO. UNESCO, and he was kind of the head of he was having the futures department. And he came in and he gave this really. Uh, inspiring talk about how we can better understand the future uh, if we just turn towards mathematics more and some of the, the words, we have to better understand anticipatory assumptions and from there we can figure out different paths people might take and once we figure out those paths we can better predict the future. I just, I kind of thought it was a little bit of like snake oil because um, if you understand uncertainty um, the way Keynes did, it's predicting the future is somewhat futile. Uh, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on, on that kind of topic. I, I think what he's, I would call what he's talking about in that state is system dynamics, looking at how the system interacts overall. And one of the, again, one of the reasons I want to have a go at Nordhaus this year is that he played the major role in denigrating the work of the limits to growth, which was actually the, the first large scale system dynamics model ever built. And economists still don't understand system dynamics. And that was the major attempt to try to see how one part of the world interrelates with another in a non equilibrium way and what feedbacks effects determine the overall system. That's largely what I think I would characterize that author's statement about future literacy. And I think that's, in that sense, I'd agree, we have to think in system dynamical terms. And that's something which is beyond our own brains. We, we can't do this sort of thinking uh, at a verbal level. And the mathematics itself can overwhelm you. So building software, which we can now do, that can simulate systems, gives us more of a capacity to understand those interrelations than we can get without that software. So learning system dynamics is what I would say is my equivalent to what he said you, you needed to do. And, but again, your question comes very important there because it's what you leave out of the system that determines its failures, not what's included in the system. And the important element is to say, okay, where, where like if you look at, say, econometrics, now econometrics tries to work out things out. If you don't include all the determining elements in your equation, then your error term is not going to be Gaussian. Okay? It's going to be non-Gaussian, massively non-Gaussian. The important stuff is going to turn up in the error term. Okay? Because that's where what you leave out of your model occurs. So if you think again in assistant dynamics, I'd be saying what's turning up in the model that is not covered by the model itself and growing over time, that's when I know that I haven't got a complete picture of what I'm looking at. And but system dynamics will give you a chance to include those elements rather than losing them. And again, the, um, the, the neoclassical fashion, you know, obsession with thinking in equilibrium terms means by imposing equilibrium on the interrelations of the system, you're again leaving out the causal factors. 
system dynamics really is the only way to bring them all together. I think with that we've come to the end of our two hours, which have gone very quickly. Um, please join me in thanking both Professor Keen and uh, Ajahn Sutipan uh, for a very stimulating discussion today. Thank you. Okay.